welcome back to the Creative Boom podcast. I'm your host, Katie Cowan, and this week I'm sharing a chat I had with someone back in early March before lockdown began. Craig Oldham is a British designer who runs his own studio in Manchester. Originally from Yorkshire, his no-nonsense approach to life and work becomes obvious the minute you click on his website. The homepage is a soundboard of his favourite movie quotes. I urge you to check it out. My personal favourites are profitable and legend. Craig has worked for many leading brands, Manchester City Football Club, the V&A, Creative Review, and he was behind the rebrand of the Brit Awards with Vivian Westwood in 2011. He's also worked with the likes of the BBC and Rough Trade. He's won a ton of awards, been featured everywhere and written for leading publications. He's also published his own books, such as In Loving Memory of Work, a visual record of the UK miners' strike 1984 to 85, which is held at the permanent collections of the British Library, the V&A and the House of Commons. Then later, recognising the gap between graduation and work, he wrote a book for emerging designers in 2018 called Oh Shit, What Now? Most recently, he's published They Live, a book that celebrates the cult sci-fi conspiracy movie by John Carpenter. I certainly had plenty to ask him. I was especially excited about geeking out on movies and conspiracy theories. I hope this conversation, recorded pre-lockdown, lifts your spirits this Monday morning. I'm here with my next guest, the lovely designer, Craig Oldham. Thank you very much for coming and meeting me here. My absolute pleasure. Hello. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've like obviously interviewed you before and been following your work. And actually, the last time we chatted, you'd just released um, this book called Oh Shit, What Now? Yes, indeed, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a while ago now, That is it? a while ago. What's been happening since then? Oh, the party never stops. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, be, I don't know. You've got a rich and varied diet of a... Work life really <laughs> yeah. to do a bit of everything, bit um, bit of teaching, bit of design work, um, bit of writing, bit of publishing, bit of this, bit of that. You know, you seem to like to look after the next generation of creatives that are coming up underneath us because that was obviously you know a thing from your book. Yeah, I mean that book was all about that. Yeah, I I, I see it as a responsibility personally. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Because I think you know they are the next generation they are the future of the industry and i think if we all hold on to those experiences that we had when we come through it um and we share those and we share the sort of things we learned and we share the sort of mistakes we made and are honest about that then i think we can make a better industry that can be more fit for purpose rather than just selling things for money all the time. Yeah, and I think that's is, really important. Absolutely. And you mentioned honesty. Um, it's not something that's very <laughs> prevalent in this industry um, sometimes. So Yeah, it, it can be. I mean, I don't know why, though. That's the thing. Because I, I think people individually are prepared to be honest. Um, and you have a, you know, you, you meet up with people. You'll know this doing this amazing podcast. You, know, you meet <laughs> with people, you have a chat and... I don't know if you get it, but sometimes they're sort of really honest and then they might change when this mic comes on. I don't know. I've seen it happen to a lot of people where they go on stage and suddenly it's like a different person that's on stage. And you're thinking, well, I'm going to admit they weren't talking about that two seconds ago when we were down there having a cup of coffee or in that pub having a beer. So why why do you feel the need to sort of put this veneer in front of you? This and, persona. Yeah. And I've never, I've never bought that. I mean, I've never... Wanted. I mean, I'm not good enough to do it. So it's like, <laughs> it's just one of those things. And I, I just, I've always held on to that kind of, I've always been really sensitive to that time when I graduated because I remember it being a pretty tumultuous time for me personally. Um, you know, people forget that if you someone like me who comes from a, you know, bare ass town in Yorkshire in the middle of nowhere, trapped in between two sort of metropolitan cities, and then I'm absconded away from my parents, probably, you know, not really been out of Barnsley, you know, as I was growing up, we'd been on trips and whatever, but I'd never been away to live and never had that kind of exposure to a cosmopolitan kind of big city. And yeah. suddenly I was cast down to Cornwall to sort of meet all these new people who were from these kinds of places. And I felt like such a weirdo and such an alien that I didn't have any kind of grounding in what they were interested in and what they were doing. And mm. that was really hard. And it took me a year to sort of settle in. And yeah. then 
just as you're settling in and finding yourself as an adult and with autonomy and independence, you're, you're cast out again. And it's it's really hard. And it's not mm. just, oh, you're moving around, but you've got to suddenly, you've got a degree and suddenly you want to have a job and you put into all that kind of stress. And it's it's just, it takes its toll. And I think people forget that. I think And I think the more we can do to sort of explain that little gap that happens between maybe graduating or maybe finding out you want to do this career, so you don't have to just start an education, of course, but just making that decision, right, I want to be a designer or work in the creative industries, and then being in the creative industries. I think if we can just tell more about, more honestly about <laughs> that kind of journey and the anxieties that come with it and the stress and the the mistakes that you make, I think the, it'll be a lot easier and a lot better, and I think that's going to open up the diversity in the industry because I think there's a lot of people shutting that gate behind them when they get in whether they're aware of it or not I don't know but I just yeah. found that really frustrating because I could never get answers to what I really wanted to know I'd see all these people come to our sort of university every Friday we had this program visiting lecturers would come and you'd get them all the you know the big names who were really lucky and you just I had like two like overwhelming feelings you'd just be like fucking hell I'm never going to be that good that make, that works amazing because all they'd ever do is so. Oh, here's a project, isn't it great? Oh, here's another project, isn't it great? And you just think, yeah, I'm never going to be that good. And then you just go away so insecure, you know, thinking, yeah. oh fuck, I'm going to work at Tesco all my life. Or, oh, for God's sake, yeah, I think. And, it, and yeah, you just like, how do I get? How do I do that? How and, do you get and there? And there's no, there was no bridge. No one told me where it was, and it just. And then you get in there and you turn around and you think that's nothing. It's so accessible and it's so friendly and mm. so warm and and sort of generous as an industry, but there is a disconnect, and that really always frustrated me as, as when I when I was a young designer, when I, and still now it really frustrates me because I see people still having to go through that. Yeah. Do you ever go to talks? Do you give talks yourself and go to these big events? And do you see sometimes some younger people sort of hopping from one foot to the other, trying to pluck up the courage to maybe come up and speak to you or other people that are there? I, I, yeah. I mean, I try not to. I try not to um, engage in any of that kind of stuff, really. I want people to just be, feel like they can just ask me anything. Mm. And when I do talks, I think that's one of the things I always try and convey to people is that, I, you know, I don't think there's anything off limits and I'm prepared to answer questions about anything, no matter how mundane or how seemingly scared somebody might be to ask it. They yeah. should ask because why not? If I have some information that, or if they think I've got some information that would help them, why why shouldn't they feel that they can tap that from me because I'm there on stage to sort of do that and that's my role like I say it's my, I see that as my responsibility as someone who's been lucky enough to have a you know colourful career in the creative yeah. industries that you know maybe I can help someone find their own way through it yeah but you're not just a designer you're a human being and they're not just a student or a graduate they're they're a human being you're exactly you, bang on <laughs> people forget that though this, it's such I a just, simple concept just, yeah. But it's, it, 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 done it, it boils my piss. It's so <laughs> stupid. I have never heard that expression before in my life. <laughs> oh, it's probably going to be the first of many. I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> I like you know, it. it's, it's, it, I, I don't understand why people are like that. I, I've always, I always remember, like I think it was Michael Wolf, his words ringing in my ears of sort of saying, "Oh, they're ringing in my ears now." You know, if you if you if you answer a question like a designer, or if you if you say something as a designer with it or within whatever your role is then you will receive an answer from whatever that person's role is mm. and i've always seen that as a real like wall it's a real barrier between you know that i think he said it in the context of sort of engaging with clients and whatever else but i see that as designer to designer you know just talk to people about uh, you you as a person and how you navigate that because yeah. we're all doing it because we apparently you know we have passions and we have beliefs and we, we we sort of see creativity as something bigger than just drawing pictures and yeah. you know things it, like that it's a it's a gesture that we feel we can put out into the world so why can't we just share and make it all a bit better yeah there's nothing wrong with talking about feelings and things we're going through and you know you might sort of turn around in your talk and say oh I had a bit of anxiety about this and some young person in that audience or even just somebody who's changed careers who who's further down the line in their in their life and work they might think gosh that's very reassuring I'm normal then and it's it's that isn't it it's just a case of checking in with yourself and going oh that person I admire he's also the same as me that is really reassuring I can go on and skip off into the sunset and feel much better about myself it's just the simplest of things it is it really is but you you know I'm I'm 
sadly, I'm constantly shocked at the amount of times where students that I speak to or graduates or just young people don't feel that. They don't get that from these luminaries that they see. Not all of them, of course, but it's it's sad to see that that is still the kind of prevalent mm. idea that these people have just made it because they're amazing. And actually, that's not the case. They've worked really hard, probably, most of them. Yeah. And they've seized opportunities when they've come their way and they've grafted and they've been prepared to ask those questions and they've come from, a lot of them, pretty humble backgrounds like everyone else has. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, I try, if I can do any little thing, then it's that, to try and get rid of that idea that there's some sort of birthmark behind anybody's ear that says, oh, you were born to do this, you know, some <laughs> crescent moon and some ceremony. It's like, it's <laughs> fucking bollocks. That. And I hate anything I can do to dispel, dispel that, yeah. the better, I think. Yeah. I think we all should do it, though. It's not just, you know, it's not my crusade. It's just, I think everybody should do that. Yeah, I feel, I feel like there is this rising tide of, of, of fight back against that. Um, people want to see the honesty. They want to see the kind of, you know, the, the highs and the lows. Yeah. Not just the highs, I mean. But we mentioned it, you know, I just mentioned it before we started about what, what you were doing and yeah. the way that you share your learnings from doing this and this new venture and how it sits with Creative Boom. And you're really open and transparent about that. And yeah. that's really important. People can learn from that and they yeah, can take sure. from that and that's a real gift for people mm. because it gives them you know maybe like you said they can relate to it maybe or they can see themselves in it in some way or they can take the little bits that they like and discard the rest and that's fine and sure. that's that's the best thing about it is that's that's a creative gesture as well being being kind of you know yeah it's realizing the world's bigger than just you um somebody actually said to me whilst i was tweeting something recently they're like what are you telling everybody what equipment you're using and you're podcasting and who you're using and how you're doing it i said yeah, why? And they were like, well, aren't you worried about, you know, giving your secrets away? I said, what, what do you mean? Anybody? No, it's not a fucking exam, is it? No, you it's know? not. I mean, sorry, friend. <laughs> I won't mention who it was. But I think, you know, fair to them. They kind of make that point because they probably are just thinking, they're probably just caring about me and making sure I'm doing all right. But the thing is, I've never seen this podcast as something that's like anything other than a great way to get, continue to give back through the spirit of Creative yeah. Boom. And, you know, when I was thinking about doing it, well, should I host it or should I get somebody else to host it? And I thought, well, actually, why was Creative Boom a good thing in the first place? It was because it had that human angle. It, it was essentially me and it still is me running the thing. So what I wanted to do was give it a voice again because for so it's been going for 10 years and it's turned into this much bigger thing it's more than me now but it's nice to be able to give some of me back because like you say it opens doors it almost builds that bridge it makes you I, funny enough you mentioned before when you put a microphone in front of some designers or illustrators or whatever it does the opposite of putting the persona up it makes everybody just open up which is a very powerful, wonderful thing. It's doing the same to me. So if anyone's listening to this and they're finding it really helpful, I mean, somebody said on Twitter the other day, they listened to something and it made them cry because they realised mm. that they were normal and going through very similar things to what you and I might go through. I mean, that's that's only got to be a great thing. But yeah, sharing the podcasting equipment and telling people how you do stuff, that's... That's, that's what we should all be doing. Definitely. I mean, I think all creativity is an exchange, you know, whether it's a, a communication that you're putting out into the world to talk to an audience, there's still an exchange that happens. You know, it might be in exchange for this gorilla playing the drums and you having a <laughs> laugh about it, you can go and buy a chocolate bar. It, it, that's an exchange, but there's also, the like you said, the human element to it. And that's an exchange of ideas or it's an exchange of experiences and feelings and those are still have value and they still fold go into that big mixer yeah then from which you draw all of your all of your ideas and all your kind of where you make all of those little connections that turn into something creative you know and you, by being open people might think oh yeah you, you're vulnerable but that also brings in help. It's not just yeah, you know does. letting the venom in. It could be that some you know the podcasting equipment. Somebody could say, "Oh, you should try this," and yeah. it might be it might improve everything. It might change things. Yeah, or it might just make you think of it in a different way. But you're only going to get that by being open and by being vulnerable with people. Mm. And I think that's really important. Yeah, definitely. I think we we all have. I think in us to put that barrier up, yeah. haven't we? We've all got it in us because we're always thinking. 
Oh, um, you know, it, it's easy to fall into the trap and we'll come on to this with one of your favourite movies, but it's it's easy to fall into this trap with these messages that are bombarding us all the time, especially in the creative community yeah. where, you know, you have to be deemed a certain way or, and, and they might not be coming from anywhere. We might just be telling ourselves that, oh, I can't show myself to be vulnerable. Otherwise that might damage my reputation and therefore I might not get clients, you know, something as simple as that. But actually it, it doesn't, it does the opposite, doesn't yeah. it? I think there are these archetypes and stereotypes that exist about what what a designer should be and what a designer should like and what you should be, you know, all these kinds of characteristics that mm. are sort of pushed on you from very, very early levels. Even your perception of what you see designers on TV or whatever, you know, this this sort of the black shirt brigade, you know, yeah. that kind of that kind of idea. And and I think. The, you can you've got to sort of step aside from that you've got to be able to particularly if you're in the industry and you're working you've got to be able to open up and not sort of involve yourself in those kinds of discussions because ultimately that's conforming yeah and i find that really if you tell any any kind of creative person that they're conforming they'll want to you know their arms will start flaying all around and they'll be like no i'm not i'm an individual and all this kind of stuff but they don't realize that they are that if if you're not defining your own kind of values of creativity and you're not wearing black t-shirts because you don't like them or whatever <laughs> if you're being yourself then if you if you're not doing that then you're ultimately conforming to someone else's idea of what creative is yeah. and what a designer should be and what a designer should like and you know a lot of that came out in my book when I did oh shit what now a lot of the feedback that came through were like in the early manuscripts and things was, are you sure you are you sure you want to say that? That's quite revealing. I put my email address in the book and just wow. to tell people to get in touch. And it's it's not necessarily hidden away, but I get so many emails from it of people just saying, thanks for that, can I ask this? And that's, like you say, that's where all the really good feedback comes from yeah. that book is when people have read it and they've, they've sort of, in, you know, engage with the tone of it or engage with the message of it or whatever they've took from it and then they've found that little little footnote and emailed me and just said thank you or they've said this or they've asked me questions and I found that so rewarding but yeah for some reason I didn't think twice about it I was just like well why shouldn't I it's oh it's, it's a, bit, a bit dangerous I don't know if it's GDP and all that not GDP <laughs> but whatever it is the, the government police and GDP Craig come on um <laughs> I, they it's were that just pancake really, you've just had. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm weighed down in this seat with all the pancakes. We're, we're having had. like a food coma. <laughs> but I, I just didn't think twice about that and I didn't think twice about anything that I was going to say that was honest in my own experiences, whether that was a stupid anecdote about my failures or, or my failures indeed or telling a story about my nan. You know, I, I, I didn't care because they all add up to the experience of what I've got and where I've been. And if I've, I'm then sharing that, then I've got to share all those things as much as the successes. I love that. And I think, you know, back then, when was it? When did the book come out? Was it 2016, 2017, something like that? Um, mm. Back then, I think there was still a lot of bravado going on um, in the industry. And now I, I really do see it changing. I, I see people opening up and mainly a lot of it's driven by this um, louder conversation about mental health. Um, especially men, men mm. talking, it's brilliant. Um, talking about their anxieties, saying, you know, they worried that they're not good enough, how they saw a talk recently and they were absolutely inspired because their favourite designer admitted that they, you know, didn't all, <laughs> always have it all figured out. Yeah, that, that they haven't got this immaculate <laughs> life. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I got to 40 and I still have these moments where I'm like, oh my God, everyone else is you know, absolutely killing it. And I'm sort of still sort of strug struggling and trying to figure things out. And and it's it's silly. You do get into these little kind of, you know, wormholes, I guess, where you forget that actually everyone's that, everyone's like that. Everyone goes through it. Everybody does. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the whole thing. I mean, for me, it's always been about defining like success and defining things on your own terms and not not sort of feeling that you 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 are an, a, an above average person or a below average person based on someone else's yardstick because I just think that's mm. you're ultimately deemed to fail because you, you you're never going to achieve your own ambitions you're just going to try and achieve someone else's yeah and I just think that success is really relative like that and success has got to be what you want it to be and you have to be your own person and mental health is so important to that and if mm. that means that you you know that you you work a different way to someone else that's fine as long as you're okay mm. 
mm. and you because the work can be done. And I think it is great that people are opening up and that people are talking about these things, but I still think people need to talk more about it. I think we can always yeah. talk more. Yeah, I was petrified about doing this um, and showing my vulnerable side and the things I've been going through. In fact, I, it all started with a confidence crash and a, a midlife crisis, very cliche, um, about a couple of years ago. And I wrote a tips article on Creative Boom about my experience. And it was very honest. And I just said it was something along the lines of, you know, what to do when you've crashed and burned and lost your confidence, you know, how to get it back. And I got so many messages, like you say, when you open up and you share this personal story, it's amazing the amount of people that just come out of the woodwork. And it was incredible because a couple of people were really famous designers and they were coming to me and saying, oh, man, that, that really resonated with me. I've been through something similar recently. And, and mostly, actually, blokes um, who are in their sort of early 40s as well, they've kind of had the same thing. They've got to 40 and they're like, oh, shit, I'm 40. And, you know, there are all these young people coming up behind me and what if I'm not good enough? And then all this kind of sort of crash of confidence happens. And but the amount of people that got in touch with me and said that was really inspiring. So that, I think, planted the seed in my head to maybe think about doing a podcast and try and not necessarily talk about what what's your inspirations and mm. what's your style? Maybe just, you know, get the story from the person because it's great looking at people's work on Creative Boom and sharing that and champion, championing that. But the real kind of goodness comes from, you know, finding out the person behind the, the pixels, I guess. No, absolutely. And I completely applaud you for that. You know, I think that's an amazing thing that you've mm. done. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying it's as easy as just doing it because it takes a lot to do that and to put yeah. your head up there and, and do it. And it's it's brave and you know, it can it can really challenge a lot of your insecurities, but yeah. as you see, people go through this all the time, and that's why when someone does open up, and you can just everybody can sort of come round in solidarity, and everybody can share experiences, and that's how we learn, and yeah. that's how we you grow, know, yeah, grow and heal and get better and and improve that for people coming behind us, so that they don't have to suffer where we did. Yeah. That's, if if that's not the point, then I don't want to engage in it yeah. because what else is there? You, you make a great point. That's exactly why I do this. I don't want I don't want people to go through what I went through. I want to show them the way. It's like almost like holding guiding a light, isn't it? And saying, yeah. "Come on, this way." I know it's a bit dark over there. Don't worry about that bit. Cut, follow me. Keep following the light, and it, it gives you that kind of boost, doesn't it? You can't deny that. Obviously, you do. You're in it to do it for yourself as well. Yeah, everybody get, gets something out of it, but there's that exchange again. You yeah, know? exactly. But yeah. the fact that you're doing something good with it is amazing. So what about your background then? Oh, wait, how far back <laughs> in the background? Well, what was your childhood like? What did, what did you do as a um, lad? Well, I mean, I, I, as I said, I grew up in Barnsley, which was a heavy industry town, coal yeah. mines, um, glass works. Were your grandparents, um, grandfathers, uh, miners? Yes, yeah. all of them. Uh, great granddad, granddad, uh, dad even, yeah. uh, all, all miners. Um, but, and, you know, we, we didn't have much at all particularly I was born in 1985 when the strike was on and I'm called to this day a strike burn or strike baby for those that you don't speak Yorkshire um, because I was East. born I was born in the strike and that yeah. was a, a pretty hard time and we had nothing um, my mum was mm. struggling with a lot of things uh, obviously my dad was out of work so the family had no money my mum was training to be a nurse at the time and she had two kids a, you know five-year-old and a seven-year-old in my older brother and sister when when she fell pregnant with me gosh so it was pretty pretty rough and then I grew up in the kind of post post strike post industrial town and I guess it's sort of a weird kind of bittersweet thing but my mum and dad separated um when I was five years old because of this strike because one thing that did come out of that kind those kind of ashes was that it was incredible for the women's movement and mm. women against pit closures and these kinds and Barnsley miners wives and these kinds of movements and sort of collectives came together. My mum was involved in some as much as she could, obviously being pregnant. She can't go on a march that much when you, you know, carrying. But she, she was involved and, and that empowered her and it empowered so many women in like my kind of communities, these patriarchal communities and that, that model of bloke does the work, brings the money in, you know, and the wife's role or the mum's role or the female role 
in that patriarchy was to look after the kids, to clean the house, to, mm. you know, do all of these things, get the shopping in, step, repeat, step, repeat. And suddenly that was smashed because the, the model wasn't there anymore because there was no work. Yeah. And I think that broke, essentially broke up my mum's marriage because as soon as my dad got some work again, it was, he was, you know, he expected the same model, I think. And my mum was like, fuck off. No way, I'm not doing that. <laughs> So I ended up being raised by these kind of warrior women in, in like people like my mum and my nan. And obviously I had some really strong men, like my granddad was a, a really important figure, but I got raised up in that kind of world where you fought for what you believed in and you were sort of proud of what you came from. And, it, and in a way it's kind of distorted a lot of the way I think about things, particularly uh, women's movements, particularly kind of diversity, because I just don't see it kind of I don't think I see it in the similar way to a lot of other men, which is weird. Yeah. Because I, I, I just grew up around really strong women. Yeah. Um, and that was great, and I was really supported. Uh, my mum is is amazing. She's absolutely amazing. One of the most inspirational people I've ever met and will ever know. Um, What's her name? Karina. Karina. Karina, yeah. What a woman. But um, <laughs> she's also a pain in the ass at times, but she's <laughs> aren't all mums. Um, oh, but yeah, so them. I sort of grew up in that, really. I mean, my mom, you know, all the kind of landmarks that a boy has, like learning how to shave, going to your first football match, things like that, they were all, like, my mum taught me how to do all those things. Wow. So it's kind of, it feels a bit weird, but that, it really did have an impact on me. Um, and I grew up, and again, but my mum became a nurse on intensive care, uh, in the Barnsley Hospital. Oh, that's um, hard work. So, yeah, so it, we we went through quite a lot. She did lots of long hours, so I spent a lot of time with my grandparents when she was doing whatever. And they they effectively r raised me as much as my mum did, really, my granddad and my nan, um, Ron and Muriel. Oh, proper granddad I always names. love to know their names. <laughs> I love to know their names. Ron and Muriel. But, um, and they were... They Are they were, still about? No, we oh. sadly lost them both, oh. um, which was tough, but yeah, they, were, they were amazing. As a, as a duo, they were amazing, but also on their own, they were amazing. What but were they like? What was he like? They were just mad. My granddad was just... <laughs> I mean, I, I always tell this story, I guess. Um, I always tell it at lectures because it's really important to me. But they, those two people taught me the most about creativity than any creative director, any designer, anyone. Um, it's like... So there's two sort of stories. My granddad, he used to... He was always fixing stuff. He never had any money, but I think because of his upbringing you know, post-war, I guess. He was always made doing mend. So he'd, he had this drawer in the kitchen. They're always in the kitchen and you'd open it and it'd just fucking vomit all this <laughs> stuff at you. String and keys and screws and just crap, tape, cooks, matches. There's always a box Pipe of cooks, cleaners, matches maybe. in there. Yeah, you know, all these kind of washers, <laughs> tat, buttons. Keys that nobody yeah, knows yeah. where they He's go. Like, Who's, what's that? And, and you'd be trying to find something and then you'd be screaming at your granddad like, fucking clean this drawer out. You can't find anything. <laughs> and he'd always be like, oh, you never know, lad, you never know. And then you'd see him fixing something in the house or he'd be fixing the car. With, and he'd, he'd sort of, it was like a ready, steady cook thing. You know, he'd, <laughs> he'd, he'd look in the drawer and look, then look away at his problem and then look in the drawer again. And then he'd, he'd just, whatever was in there, he'd find a way to fix the problem that was in front of him. And I used to be amazed by how he, how he knew that something in there could fix something elsewhere that seemed completely alien to me. <laughs> so I was always amazed by this kind of pure problem solving, this pure kind of raw creativity that he, he sort of exerted all the time. Yeah. And, you, you know, you'd say to him, as, as I sort of grew up and I understood these terms and I was taught that, oh, the designer does this and this is creative and all that kind of stuff at uni. And you'd come back home at weekend or whatever and you'd say to him, oh, that's really creative, that. And he'd just be like, what? Eh? He didn't, you know, he, he did, didn't recognise what that was. He'd just call me like, stop being soft or something, you know. He just, he just never understood that creativity was a thing. I don't think he ever ever really understood what I did for a living. He was just quite happy that I was doing something I liked. Oh. But teaching me that, that actually creativity is something everybody does mm. all the time. Would they you? just don't call it that. For me, it was like absolutely mind-blowing and, and eye-opening. And for, with my nan, um, I did one of the first projects I ever did from sort of start to finish, as it were, um, was, a, was a book. And... 
I was so proud of this. I was only, you know, I'd only been out of uni like six months or something. So I'm like, I'm almost carrying it around like dead chuffed. Like, ooh, I've done a book. Look at this. I've done this all myself. I didn't do it all myself, obviously, but I was telling everybody I did. And, I, and I'd just be like chucking it right. Look, oh, look, man, look at this. And, oh, I thought look, we were being oh, honest. You know, well, you know, white lies. But it, she says, oh, look at this, look at this. But this is it. The honesty thing comes in now. So I showed my nan. She was like my victim. Oh, I look, nan, look at this. And of course, she's like, oh, I love, this is lovely. And she's like, oh, have you wrote this? And I've like, no, Nan. So she's flicking through this book. And then she's like, oh, right. She's like, oh, have you took all these pictures then? I was like, no, Nan. And she's like, okay. And you could see her getting more confused. And then she's like, oh, you do oh you've done these drawings, aren't you? You always used to be good at drawing, Craig. I'd be like, no, Nan. So she's sort of getting really <laughs> more, ever more perplexed as she's slowing down <laughs> with this book. And, and um, she was just like, so, so what did you do, love? And I said, well, I picked this lovely typeface. And I, look at that. I was like, look at that white space. Look at that grid there, Nan. Oh, ain't it, oh, ain't it great? And she just shut it, threw it on the floor. And she went, you want a cup of tea, love? I was just like, no, Nan. Started looking no, at your thumbs. And, yeah. And I'm just like, I was burned, you know. I just thought, wow, wow. And my first reaction as a young designer, sort of still with that kind of, poison in me that I know better as a designer I'm, I'm a designer I know what design is which is fucking again nonsense but th this is the point I'm there thinking well what does me nana know she, she, you know she never did this she just worked in the NHS she don't know good design when it drops in front of her like that and I used to think all this stuff and then I just thought as more I thought about it I thought actually you know what she's, she's right Yeah. what she cared about was the content and she just cared what this book was about because great and design, you can't book. see it, can you? Yeah, and she was just, and she taught me that actually, if you've got fuck all to say, the best design in the world won't save you. So, have something to say first, and then use design as a tool. And it's design. She taught me essentially that design is a means and not an end. And if all you're doing is sort of just trying to make things look good or trying to have a style, for lack of a better term, that's not what design is to me design is is problem solving the design is is a, is a kind of a communication thing and it's it's an intellectual discipline and it happens in the head and you think about things so much more than you actually spend moving them around on your software or whatever you you, you look to what the human impact is going to be or how, a, how the human interaction with it or even the human communication with it and then you say okay if that's what we're trying to achieve what's the best way to achieve that now, that might be a lovely book. <laughs> that might be a fucking chest of drawers. It could be anything, but that's the intellectual discipline I think design is. And I think there's a little visual kind of ad break that happens in the hour-long programme. There's a little ad break at the end where you do some visuals. And that's that's the graphic element of the design for me. It's mainly about and our that brains. Comes from, yeah, and that comes from my nan, not some bold creative director in his 50s wearing a black T-shirt, you know. <laughs> with a big beard yeah I used to, just the bald thing that's not a dig I used oh, right, to, okay. <laughs> there used to be a, 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 I'll give him a shout out I used to, a designer Jordan uh, and he worked with me when I worked at another agency and he, he was for years he was he was curating this gif every time he saw like on on a, a, a you know a design awards page or in the press a little profile picture you know like they have those little thumbnails of what oh this is so and so has written this article or this whatever whenever he saw a designer a male designer it was only males but whenever he saw a male designer that had a shaved head he used to steal the picture and he had a bold designer's gif <laughs> and he just had this this weird morphing of all these bold designers he thought it was really hilarious and as did I but <laughs> well that's good having a bit of a sense there's of humour there's a tangent for you <laughs> no it's great it's great to hear about your upbringing <laughs> it kind of explains a lot and it yeah it kind of um, it, it kind of defines you doesn't it that, it does oh, that strong Yorkshire I, I guess, family I, background I think the thing that I'm most ashamed of though is that I had to sort of go through a really kind of awful process to, to, to see the value in that and I think that's that's why, I, I, you know, the stories about my nan and granddad, as funny as they are, took me years to get my head around because, as I said, I, I felt kind of weird in Barnsley, this industrial town where all my mates were either, you know, joining the police or the fire brigade or they were going into heavy industry or whatever. They, did, they, they, they were pursuing interests, but they weren't necessarily creative interests, apart from the odd couple. One of them wanted to be an actor, who is an actor, which is great. But, great. Um, and I wanted to do this thing called graphic design, which no one could understand and I couldn't explain. So I felt a bit a little sort of on the periphery. Yeah. So I, th I thought uni was going to be the thing. I thought, right, I'll go to university and I'll do a degree in this and everybody's going to know what it is. And I'm going to be 
like amongst my people, you know. <laughs> so I went to I went to Falmouth and I got there and everybody was even diff- more different from me. They, even though we we're doing the same subject, they were all like, as I said earlier, like they're from these Cosmo cities like Bristol and London and Exeter, and they're from the and they've got all these references and they are they're all into skating and surfing and and they've all got that kind of look and they're all in vans and baggy jeans and they, they're all great at this and I was there in my trackies you know liking football <laughs> thinking oh my what's what's this this is not what I thought so I but I but I, the, this this I'm so ashamed I looked at that and I thought okay I'm different I need to be like that to be a good designer because they're obviously great and I looked up to them my peers yeah and I was getting told, oh, you need to go to London to have a great career by my tutors. And I'm being told this is what great design is and these agencies do it really well. So I'm thinking, even though some of them, I was like, well, that's fucking horrible. I hate that. I used, yeah. to, I used to think, well, it's me. I'm the problem. I have to be like that. So I have to look at those agencies and like their work. I have to do work like them. I have to dress like them and act like them and listen to their music. And I sort of thought for a long time, well, that's what I have to do. And then I got into the industry and that was perpetuated again. This is what a designer is like. This is what designers are into. And I, and again, I behaved it. I remember like phoning my mum up and just saying, mum, can you put some more money in my bank so I can buy some black T-shirts and some Converse? <laughs> She's like, what, what do you want them for? And I, it's like, Cause that's what we wear. That's what they're wearing, mum. You, know? <laughs> you want to conform. <laughs> yeah. and, it just, but, and, and I, look, and I, I used to think and... I, all this stuff, and I used to, I was shedding it, trying to shed my kind of past and me and me upbringing and my culture because it wasn't, it didn't fit this mold that was put in front of me. Yeah. And I'm ashamed to say that that's what I did. You know, for years I just thought, well, I've got to do that because that's what I want to be. I wanted to be that so much. Mm. And then it started as I got more confidence in the industry working, and as I, as I sort of as you know started to say my concerns to people, or I'd start saying, well, I don't actually agree. I think that's wrong, or I, th- I, I, I like this idea more than that one. Why can't we do this? And the more that that came through in in myself, that's when I started thinking, well, maybe I don't have to be like that. Why yeah. can't I be? It doesn't make me any less of a designer. And there was one turning point where we were all. I remember we were in a studio at an agency, and uh, somebody brought something up on I don't know Creative Review or something, or it's uh, one of the. Trendy was before Creative Boom, but it was one of the trendy <laughs> ones, you know. And they were like, "Oh, fucking look at that project there!" Oof. And then there's all this little gaggle of designers around going, "Oh, look at that!" Ooh, you know, all clucking away. <laughs> and um, flapping their arms. Yeah, do you know what I mean? And you then and they were all and I thought it was dog shit this project. <laughs> I really did. And I sort of said, "I, I think that's crap." I think what did really they all bad. do? Was there, a, and there, an there was this, you know, gasp. this yeah, this gasp, and they, you know, the, their arms flew up on the foreheads, and they were like, "Oh, how how dare you, blasphemer!" You know, and I just well, and I sort of went, "Well, I think it's shit because of this, 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 and this." And that was the real turning point for me because I was much more interested in all the stuff that I was finding, and at the same time, I'd found my mum's mum and dad's record collection where they'd made their own sleeves for stuff where the original sleeves had fallen ah. to pieces so they'd been like stapling wallpaper together and <laughs> yeah and, and drawing this this weird shit and putting them in carrier bags and all sorts of stuff oh. and I thought that was really great yeah. and then they're all looking at this really polished corporate identity and I thought it is what it is but it's not for me and that's where I started to diverge and I just thought actually I've lost a lot of time trying to be like these people that I'm not was this in when, London? It was in London and in Manchester. Yeah. Did you did you lose your accent and try and as well? I've never lost the accent. And when you had your turning point, did you just suddenly become Yorkshire oh, I've again? I've tried, yeah. It's <laughs> no, it's a great accent. Emmerdale on air. But, um, no, it's lovely. I know, I, I, yeah, I used, I, used to, I used to try, particularly in London, because you just... I mean, I get it now and I, people... It's, it's the stupidest thing to whinge about, but I'm going to whinge anyway. You're there are far to. There are far bigger problems in the world than me you know, worrying about this, but when people sort of repeat what I say in as if they're in my accent, so he says, oh, where are you from? I'm from Barnsley. And they go, Barnsley! And you, I want to smack their face in. <laughs> it really drives me mad. Because you think, oh, you're just being funny. But it's uh, actually, it, it actually, when, when the hundredth still... person the day has said it to you, it, it can upset you a little bit, you know. Well, I don't I don't know... do it to Scousers and I don't do it to Geordies no, or Scottish. Wouldn't, would you? I, don't, I don't start repeating their accent. But yeah, that is annoying when people sort of take the mic. Yeah, but they, th- they probably think they're trying to get on your level. But it is, it, especially in when you're down south in London and people have got you know quite neutral accents, and then they just sort of pick up on your accent and they have to they have to know where you're yeah. from and then but they you, have to you know, imitate you, you. When you're 20 or 21 and 
you're in London, a city that you've only ever visited once to go to the Natural History Museum on a school trip, <laughs> yeah. like I had, and people are gathering around you, laughing at you because you've got a funny accent and you bought a candle like dandelion and burdock. <laughs> That that really hurts. Sorry, I shouldn't. Be no, I know you're, you're laughing now, but at the time, you, are, you like have I said, got a big cheeky grin on your face. Yeah, I must sorry. say, I know it sounds like I say it's the most. I don't want my listeners to think I'm just thing. always laughing at my guests. <laughs> it's one of the most pathetic things to sort of talk about, but you know, it, it does it does get to you. My mum had it when she was um when she went to university. She was from Durham, and she went to um, Coventry Polytechnic. To, to become a teacher because she knew she wanted to be a teacher. And when she was down there, all the other kids were just, go on, Claire, say something. Because, you know, it was like 1970-something. Sorry, Mum, you're still very young to, to me and everyone. You still we look amazing. You. Um, but, yeah, it was like the early 70s or something. Um, and they were just, it was almost like they were poking her with a stick. Say something, Claire. She'd go away. No, I'm not saying anything. You know, I'm probably doing a Newcastle accent there. I'm going to really offend anybody from Durham. But... Um, yeah, it's a funny thing. It's 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 nice actually. Since I've done this podcast, a few people have emailed and gone. It's so nice that there's a podcast for the design community that's so diverse and northern. I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't really think about that. It's just a bit of an accident. Well, that's another box of frogs, isn't it? The northern thing outside London. I mean, yeah, it they've can... had their time, if you ask me. The north will rise. <laughs> Are we going to rise? I love it. We're we going to have sticks. Fucking rise. <laughs> I've got my John Snow coat there. You know, Game of oh, Thrones yeah, look inspired. At that. Yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? I like how regal it looks, hooked on the back of that chair. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like you could walk in any minute now and go, right, lads. We just need to lay a sword across the chair, and then we're, we're all good, aren't we? How did you feel about Game of Thrones when I, that came out? I'm not into it. I'm not You're into not? Game of Thrones. No, you're not into I'm any honest. of that fight, fighting. My wife Ellen, stuff. Ellen watched it, and she sort of it was one of those like working programs that she'd have on as she was doing a little bit of this or that or pottering or whatever. Yeah, um, and she got really into it, and she loved Sean Bean. Oh yeah, uh, so great. the first series was you know absolute heaven for her, but. Although I, I mean, I'm saying that he could have died in the first episode like he does everywhere else. Um, <laughs> It's but, expensive. But yeah, so I've floated <laughs> in and out with it. I've had a flirtatious kind of yeah. relationship with Game of Thrones. But that's, yeah. but that's the thing I loved about it the most, you know, in the, all in the north, all the northern accents. Yeah, yeah, true. There'll be people in America listening to this podcast episode thinking, gosh, I wonder if Craig's also secretly, you know, got a Jon Snow coat and a stash of yeah. swords on his They don't on know what I'm sat here wearing, do they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in drag. Yeah, but talking about movies, you're pretty much into... I mean, your website, by the way, goes against everything. You know, it, it hints at that kind of humour that you have, that upbringing, that creativity, um, and a love of, of the culture that, you know, we've touched upon just before. Yeah. I, I was clicking on a few things and I got Arnie saying... Um, just get to the it's choppers. Not a tumor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Kindergarten. Get to the choppers there, a brilliant yeah. one. I, my favourite Arnie quote is when he goes, um, if it bleeds, we can kill it. Yeah, there's loads. It's just brilliant. There's that brilliant YouTube, isn't there? The 140 Arnie quotes or whatever it. it is. Oh. If I, I need to cheer myself up, I'll watch that or I'll watch um I think what's the I, other yeah. one? Uh, Owen Wilson says, Wow. Have you oh, seen that one? No, I haven't, no. Someone sent me the uh, the Trump China one as well, which is quite funny. Oh, I've which not is seen him that. saying China about a million times, China. which is hilarious. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the way, I'm glad you said that actually, because a lot of people don't get the website. A lot of people think it's just they just don't get it. Oh, I love it. And I actually think it, for me, it was like really obvious. It was just like, well, well, it's not really obvious, but it is. It's about personality. And it's yeah. like I don't want to. It's different. Because my experience before that, before sort of setting up on my own. And working at other agencies and seeing how other agencies do it was 90% or even more so when people used to come to work with us, they'd say, oh, we really like that project you did for so-and-so. Can you have, Can we have something like that? Mm -hmm. And I used to hate that because it's, it's already kind of half of it's predefined yeah, already. Exactly. And it's a bit like, well, yeah. no. Where's the creativity? Yeah, and it goes back to that kind of what you're trying to achieve, how do we achieve it? Mm. Kind of, not philosophy, that's a grand word for it, but, you know, that kind of principle. Yeah. And if they're already saying, oh, we want this, this, this and this, then what's the, where's the challenge in that? Mm. So, we, I mean, I always push back on that, but that's why I don't show any work on there because it's just like I kind of want to step away from that. I realise now that, I mean, I did that six years ago, so that needs to be addressed. I do need to actually distribute work. I don't know, work. I love it, I love it. But all that kind of personality and fun is still going to be retained. If you ever change it, can you 
have like for fans of the old site click here um don't worry i am i mean i'm in the midst of changing it at the moment and i have vastly expanded the soundboard yeah <gasps> so there's got a lot more we, are you old enough were you old enough um when you know the days of the internet were just kicking off oh you know? yeah geocities oh geocities. i love geocities yeah oh my all goodness all those gifs oh so good there's, there's a great site actually I can't remember which one it is. It's on the if you look on GeoCities on the Wikipedia page, there's two links in there, and it's just someone has archived all of the mail <gasps> gifts and all of the under construction gifts from GeoCities. Wow! Fantastic. There's a Google that That's now if you really listen to it. That's a really good tip. Get that is. I'm, I'm going to do that afterwards. Um, I also clicked on one that was of Ren and Stimpy. Yes. I think it was Joy. It's interesting. I, uh, <laughs> happy, I wonder. Happy. I wonder what the most. Can, uh, do you track the most? Do you clicked? know what? I don't know if I can do that actually. That's you probably do a question that. for someone else. I don't know what the most clicked one is. Because I think um, I, I did click on Joy and I probably c clicked on, I think there might have been an assault one, maybe? I don't know. There's lots of them. I forget what they are. And myself. I got a Forrest Gump as well. Yeah, there's a lot of Gump in there. <laughs> there's a lot of Gump in there. <laughs> so that comes from a love of movies. Um, have you got a favourite or is that just for somebody that loves... I can't do favourites. No, I, I, I really know. struggle with favourites. I mean, it's because it it's like a mood thing. It's like, I don't know if I'm, if it's just me, but I, I assume everybody's similar where, much like music, you know, when you if you listen to music when you're working, you, you, know, you say, oh, I'm right in a mood, I'm in a mood for that today and yeah. not that. And sometimes you want something grim on, sometimes you want something <laughs> really happy, sometimes you want something that's ambient, you know, that's it's, it's sort of tapas. Of, of through movies is how I feel. So some days it's one film, some days it's another. Yeah. I kind of grace through them and I constantly change my mind, yeah. You kind of revisit things a lot as well, don't you? You have to leave mm. it. Sometimes I feel like I have to leave a movie like that I might have seen 20 times for maybe a year and then there'll just be this growing bubble in my stomach and I'll be like... Oh, yeah. I really want to put Lost in Translation back on. Or yeah, I mean, I have that. I have a kind of weird, kind of parallel with it. I get obviously because I do a lot of work within films now. Um, well, not work, but you know, I, I sort of I have an interest, and I'm trying to sort of push that interest into things that people seem to want to share, like books and sort yeah, of things yeah. like You've that. Yeah, got so a few I, side things yeah, going on. I'm doing you? that, and that's really film sort of focused. So if I'm researching a certain film you, you'll find out that all film is self-referential it's this lovely kind of universe where they all nod to each other and yeah it's so rich and i love that side of it so i'll i might be researching a particular film and i'll start watching all those other films that are associated to it or have come before it and so on so i fall down that rabbit hole a lot but also i, I get really obsessed with certain films like i, I remember last year um the lynn ramsey film you wouldn't you were never really here with joaquin phoenix in it I got obsessed with that and I watched it about five times in a weekend. Good grief. Um, and I can do that where I just, I study them and I can't stop watching them and I see little things every time I watch it and the things like that that really kind of get under my skin. That other people really might not even, it. yeah, they I don't, might I don't not know even if, I'm sure other people do, but for me, I just can't, I like, have this weird itch I have to scratch. I have to watch it again. Well, well was that idea right? Do, should I go back and watch it? Yeah. But that film for me was particularly Well, they're present. so creative and there's so many different creative things coming together to make this epic thing. Yeah. It's a joy. Um, I know people who say to me that they don't like movies and I'm, I'm like, what, what, is, what is wrong with you? I mean, sorry if you don't like movies out there, but for me, they're just... Oh, yeah. They're just a joy. They're one of my reasons to live, you know, to be able to go to the cinema and be taken away into this other often galaxy or other so, I mean, yeah i mean i i mean i love it i absolutely love it i always have films have always been a massive part of my life like growing up and stuff i used to love watching them i was never one of those kids that you know you put a film on you get the first 10 minutes and then run off and play with your toys or whatever i was always you know mouth on the floor eyes on the screen <laughs> yeah. but mouth agape you know watching whatever it was and i, I you know i was lucky or unlucky <laughs> to have an older brother and sister who would allow me when they were babysitting to let me watch stuff that i probably shouldn't be watching or, <laughs> or my mum would beat the hair off them for you know letting me watch what, I like, um, they made, Top Gun, maybe the one that stuck with me the most because it frightened the life out of me was they made me watch this the serialization of stephen king's it when you know the tim oh, curry one. Oh my went. goodness how old are you oh i was i must have been about i think it was like 90 95 or something when that 93 when it came out so i must i would have watched it later when it was on mm -hmm. telly so i'd have been about 10 if Aww. that 
terrified the life out of me. It's a, I've never watched it because yeah. of, for that very reason. I can't I always, do clowns. I always thought it was a film, but it's a t- I look now and obviously you, you look on IMDb or whatever and it's a TV series and it's like six hours long. Good grief. And I remember watching that in one sitting, so Lord knows what I was doing in my days <laughs> and how we got through that in one sitting. But yeah, it was things like that. And then they'd also spring all these other weird little films that they'd got that were, again, probably they would have missed me because I wasn't that generation. You know, they grew up in the 80s because um, they were five and seven when I was born. So they had that kind of world and they sort of gave me a little bit of that as I grew up in my own sort of world. Yeah. So again, I had this kind of parallel where we'd be watching all these weird films from the 80s that no one in, in my age remembers or they've watched as an adult now, so they know it. But I used to get all that as well. And, you know, you mentioned the labyrinth earlier, didn't you? Things like that. Oh, I love that the labyrinth. used to grow up with, you know, you just amazing. It was magical. Yeah. But I think there was a golden, and maybe it's just nostalgia, but for me, I feel like there was a golden moment for movies before massive big effects came along. Um when you had things like the Goonies and Labyrinth and mm. what else was it? The Explorers. Do you remember the Explorers? Flight of the Navigator, maybe Flight on the, the Navigator, Fringe. Navigator, definitely remember that. that I used fantastic. to love that. I used to love that. I watched yeah, that the Dark other day. Dark Crystal, all of those. The Dark Crystal, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I mean, again, you, you, they're sort of, they're like little pockets of time, aren't they? You know, mm. the kind of Jim Henson, Steven Spielberg, yeah. George Lucas kind of. Magical. Yeah, Star Wars. Bringing, bringing a bit of what they were doing in their kind of adult careers into the kind of children, family kind of breed. And they were mixing stuff like Gremlins as well, you know, where Steven Spielberg's bringing that in. Obviously, Joe Dante directed that, I think, but clashing those two worlds of horror and the Spielbergian family fucking thing, (laughs) which, yeah, we'll not go on to that. Oh, you're not a fan? I'm not not a fan of Spielberg, no, and I get (gasps) lynched for it by saying it, but I'm not. I'm going, I'm going. (laughs) Yeah, I think he peaks with Jaws. I thought, I thought Jewel was Jaws amazing. Jaws is an amazing film. And then I thought Jaws was an amazing film. But I thought after that, he just got a bit too friendly for me. Like E.T. and all that. I just can't fucking stand it. <laughs> but I'm, yeah, I'm a miserable git. E.T. is a bit mental, actually, if you think about it. It I mean, always this... makes me cry, though. Even if I watch it now, I always cry my eyes out at mm. the end. I'm a softie. Yeah, I mean, I admit to watching it as a kid, and I did love it, but... It's, there's just, I don't know, there's a, a kind of, I don't know, I, th- I think, it, whereas other directors could have made it really edgy, he always softens off the tips. Yeah, it does that, have soft focus, and definitely. That's, that's the thing I, and I can't quite respect him for. Yeah. Every now and again, I want to, I want someone to, ooh, yeah, sod, you know, I want someone to poke me yeah. and jab me and really just upset me. you. And I want someone to challenge me. Mm. Whereas E.T.'s, or, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really having a go at E.T. here, but a lot of Spielberg's kind of films for me always just kind of, they just give you a nice little pat on the back when you finish with you. You'll be okay. It's a bit twee. Sometimes I don't want to feel okay. I want to feel scared and I want to feel hopeless or I want to feel an emotional wreck in one way or another. I'm trying to think what children's movies, because we did have that as well. We had quite a few kind of movies that did that, that had that unusual twist and you were left feeling as a kid. Hang on a minute. Where's the uh, where's the pat on the back? Where, but then they would they were the ones that stood stood with you and and stayed with you, and really made you think, and really changed your perspective on the world. And that's that's kind of like a gift in itself, isn't it? I'm trying yeah. to think what kind of you know on the spot. I can't think of anything, but there were many movies yeah, from but, that time. I mean, that's another thing I love about films. You know, I love that they have these purposes, and whether they're intentional or not, they can they can help you through things and they become filters through which you, you can sort of understand the world, particularly as a kid. You know, if, if you know, watching The Lion King or Bambi and you start to think about your parents in a different way because they lose their parents in that and yeah. it sends them on this whole kind of arc and stuff and, yeah, there's all that Shakespearean shit in there as well. But they're, they're, they're you know, on the most basic examples, but they're, they're, they're ideas that you can engage with as a child that then lead you on to the more bigger human ideas of understanding things around you and not being so self-centred that you are as a kid until you sort of grow out of it. Yeah. And I think film can do that for children. It can also do so many other things as well, of course. But it, it never stops. As you grow, you still find those things, those subversive ideas in films that, as I say, provoke you and challenge you and confront you and and give you a sort of a little 90-minute break in which you can maybe think about something a little bit differently 
or challenge yourself on what your preconceived ideas were or what you brought to that film might not be what you take away from it yeah. or equally you might come away with something completely different after this 90 minute cinematic experience that for me is such a unique thing mm. that happens in films when was the last time you felt that Probably the you were never really here. Oh, right, I don't okay. know actually because uh, the ghost. I went when I went to watch Ghost Story in the cinema with Ellen, um, the one with uh, Affleck, Casey Affleck in it, where he's in that sheet. Mm. Have you seen it? No. It's. I think it's on Netflix now actually. But I remember going to see that in the cinema, and coming away feeling really moved by it. Yeah. And it's one of those. It's one of the weirdest things, but it's actually a good example of what to talk about actually, because the whole premise of it. Is is an, is a really kind of haunting, moving story. Yeah. But he's in a bedsheet for the entire film as a ghost, and you think, <laughs> what a ridiculous idea. But if you allow yourself to sort of let that wash over you, mm. or actually confront the idea of that's just a visual to denote something, move away with it. It's a visual language that we can all engage with, get past it, then engage with what the story's trying to tell you. It's really, really engaging and really powerful. I remember coming out of that one, just just sort of wandering with my head up just thinking what what was that about and <laughs> wow that was really interesting and I love that and you'd, you'd just start thinking about it and little details had come to you as you remembered them and yeah that was a really kind of moving experience for me but it does it's not just new films either it's, it's I could be watching a dvd or something comes on film four or something yeah that you've never seen and you think whoa I've rewatched The Exorcist <laughs> recently Oh, which is, I've been hammering quite a lot. What do you I'm, think of it? I love The Exorcist, yeah. It's really dark. I mean... It, it struggles now because it's, it's had so many different cuts. It's yeah. a bit like The Blade Runner and The Shining, you know, they've had so many different ooh, director's cut oh, and all the, the version you've never seen. And there's all these kinds of weird versions of the film. So you never really know which one to trust or, mm. or do, do you know, is the original the only one that you should ever go back to? Is that the sort of... You know, the, That's an the interesting absolute question, totem. Actually. Yeah, cause... because if you watch Blade Runner, you, it can be about different things depending on which cut you watch. Yeah, because in the in the the final final cut, which is the most recent one, it's almost like that's what Ridley Scott wants you to think. And he, you know, it, it doesn't leave any ambiguity about whether it's a, you know, a fucking android or whatever. It doesn't leave any of that <laughs> up for debate. It's kind of all there for you yeah. to take. Whereas the original is much more ambiguous, and there's so many more gaps for you to sort of plug in what you want and, and in a, not make the film what you want it to be about but a little bit of that and I find those stories much more interesting where you are almost a participant in what the film means and or it's not necessarily people I think when they're watching films they get so fixed on what's this film about yeah they don't have to be about anything they like, can just be a story yeah and like, you can take from that what you want when then when the ending happens and people are like afterwards what do you think happened what do you think he said to her what, what, what do you think will yeah. happen next? I'm like, well, that's up to you to decide. That's it's, the whole point. It's like the internet's brought, they call it immersive criticism. And The Shining has been a, a, a big example of this where because um, films aren't as exclusive as they once were, you don't have to, you can, you know, you can see them more than just at the cinema now. Yeah. And the VHS helped and then DVDs and Blu-rays helped and now we can stream it, pause it for days and come back to it and whatever else. It took me a while but, to get my head around that, by the way. What? Just streaming. Yeah, it's, it, it took me a while to go from putting DVDs into my PS4 and, I, I and then just downloading DVDs. them. I'm a weirdo. I still like no, to I don't own think that's something. Weird. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you like to hold you know, it. You know, in your I hands. still like to just sort of have no, that physicality. That. Yeah, but I was born in '78, so I grew up with tape cassettes and a Walkman. Oh, tape! I miss tapes. You I were really born. You're tapes. the same age as my little brother, so I'm seven years older than my little brother. So I'm very much aware of the world you grew up in. But for me, it was like, yeah, we. I really have seen, you know, the the communications world yeah. completely transform. So I'm still getting mad. And like, even with computer games, I'll buy them, and then I'll get home, and Tom would be like, "You, you do know you can just download that." Um, I was like, "Oh, um, yeah, but I don't, I don't trust it." <laughs> no, I'm, yeah, I, but I think we were, you know, we were at the kind of, and I'm, I'm, I'm smashing us all into one group here, but. We we had to go through the internet being absolutely crap. Yeah, we did. We had to go through dial up. Oh, we God, had to you go remember? through yeah, running a wire through the house to the only yeah. socket down the stairs and everything. <laughs> you know, we had to go through that just to load up a one web page. We used to never mind this idea that it's all in the cloud. You know, well exactly, <laughs> which I yeah, like you don't trust. Well, I was seven when you were born, so 
my dad had a ZX Spectrum. And if we wanted to play a computer game, we had to like set the game to load. And then I'd go down for my tea. Sorry, mum, dinner. And uh, (laughs) mum's got this thing. She says, Uh, never say dinner. I know exactly what you mean. It's a similar thing. I'm a dinner. Yeah, dinner. Sorry, mum. Go downstairs for my dinner and then I'd go back upstairs and then the computer game would be loaded. And that, and that is kind of what I grew up with. So for me, now playing playing a cowboy on a computer game in a world where I can go around wherever I want, if yeah. I want, I can sort of just pet my horse, take it to the stables, get it a really nice plaits in its hair, and then maybe go and just sit and have a drink at a bar and maybe just stroll around, maybe like go and do some hunting. It's just bizarre, but wonderful and glorious. And they're turning into movies now as well. You get to play yeah. the main character. You get to go into this virtual world and be the, the movie star. It's amazing. I think that's been quite an interesting transition between games design and mm. games marketing and films is that films have become more gamified yeah. and games have become more cinematic. Isn't the games industry worth more than yeah, the film more, industry? Worth more than I think a Anything. lot of industries combined. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if you look at a, a, you know a, any kind of TV ad now for Halo or whatever the game is, you know Call of Duty Forty Six or however many they're on, you know <laughs> they're they're, all, they're just trailers. They're trailers for films. Yeah, and and it's all you've always got that little thing in the bottom corner saying not actual gameplay, <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. But they, they are they just the, the games are advertised like films now. Yeah, and equally it's amazing. You know, you get again a Spielbergian sort of Ready Player One kind of thing where their tra- films are trying to tap into that hole, and all the Avengers stuff and all that—that that is all part of that gamification of cinema yeah. now. That was a good book, by the way. The Re- Ready, Ready Player, Player One. One. I've not read it. It's a good book, mm. movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not keen on the film. Yeah, right? yeah. Anyway, moving on. You have just released a book called They Live. A Visual and Cultural Awakening. Mm-hmm. And now this is a book based on John Carpenter's a classic film, which I have not seen. I'm very sorry. We're going to have to um, remedy that. I'm going to buy it tonight, actually. I'm going to download it with oh, trepidation. I'll I'm going to download DVD, it mate. and make sure <laughs> that it's downloading. And I'll ask my husband, Tom, who's technically, um, is, is a technical genius. I mean, he'll roll his eyes listening to this because he'll be like, for goodness sake, it doesn't take a genius to just download a movie. But I'll be like, am I doing it right? Um, Am I pressing the right button now? Is it on Apple TV or is it on this other thing? Or do I download it from the PlayStation? And he'll just be going, oh, my God. Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> I watched the trailer and I got a gist of what it is. And, and I started to realise, oh, yeah, OK, I get this. There's, <laughs> this is like something you could really delve into headfirst and get very nerdy very quickly about the typography, the, Absolutely. the, the one-liners. I mean, even the mullet of the lead character. Which is what you've just described is exactly what I did, yeah. um, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, it, it, for Sounds me, it's, it's the perfect, it's not the perfect film in, in the sense of it's a, it's a perfect crafted film, but it it operates on, on every level that I think a film should in that you can watch it for 90 minutes and it can be an absolute bullshit B-movie <laughs> uh, piece of trash where you can just sort of put it on almost just let it wash through you it's like a Sunday get, afternoon you, yeah, film you get isn't all it? your kind of 80s sugar from it and then <laughs> you just turn it off refreshed and walk away or you can delve a bit more deeper and, and, and see it for what maybe it's trying to be and yeah, what this... it is and the kind of subversiveness of it of it being a com- social commentary and it's very political and it's very mm. very challenging in a lot of what the 80s was it was released in 1989, just as the El- um, the Americans had got rid of Reagan and, and brought in George Bush Senior, who was his vice president, mm. and it was it's a real reflection on society in that time of Reaganism and you Consume. know neoliberalism, Thatcherism, um, marry and reproduce. Yeah. For those of you that haven't seen it, I guess it's just yeah. <laughs> There'll be somebody it's, listening to this somewhere in the UK about? going, yeah. oh, I need to go and buy something. Oh, if I need to get yeah. married. If you haven't seen it, it's this weird kind of. Uh, the the idea of it is it's an alien invasion movie basically yeah and these aliens that are amongst us that look like us in a kind of you know invasion of the body snatchers kind of thing yeah they have they are mind controlling us and all advertising and all kind of consumer media from packaging and what you buy in the supermarkets to you know advertising and TV programming is brainwashing and it's all in beautiful colour and then the the rebels. I've made these sunglasses that allow you to see the truth. And when you put them on, <laughs> everything's in black and white. And all that media just is plain type that just says obey, buy, consume, marry and reproduce, uh, you know, honour apathy, all this kind Don't of stuff. Don't think. Mm. 
all these kind of dangerous, scary messages. Which are, actually, it's a very good um, interpretation of, of the world today. Isn't it, it is. I mean, it's that's the, that's again talking about it like the the Blade Runner analogy. It just, there's a, it's it's almost a vessel mm. in that you can. I mean, and this is a gift and a curse in it. Of, of the film, but you can pour into that what you think it's about. You know, the goodies could be this and the baddies could be that. And you can, they're, they're interchangeable. You know, you can make them who you want. Yeah, yeah. And say, oh, it's about this, or, oh, it's about that. And that's, a kind of, as I say, it's a gift and a curse because it could be a really kind of positive thing. And pe or people, which has happened, like the far right have taken it and say it's about it's sort of a, mm. you know, a Zionist conspiracy and all this fucking nonsense. Oh, dear. But, which the director came out and said, yeah, that's absolute bollocks. Um, <laughs> so good on John for that. Yeah. But it is, it's got all these levels and that was why I really loved it. Um, but it's, it's the part of a series, um, the book. So it's the first of a series that we're calling the Epiphany Editions, which yeah. are going to be published by Rough Trade. Great. And it's essentially, and this is a nosebleed inducer, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's creating books that don't exist. So these books are props in films, but they're not real books. Right. But, but someone will go, a character in the film, and they'll pick up this book and it's usually a catalyst within the story that it, everything kicks off from that point or it changes the story or it impacts that character or it's pivotal in the kind of wider scheme. Uh, and we are reproducing those for real. Wow. And then filling those books with critique about the culture in which the film was made and then the culture that the film had afterwards. And ooh, They this, Live is the first one. Like I, can, I said, I can tell. I can tell this is a real kind of, ooh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it is. It really is. Love I mean, it. it is really geeky, but it's also kind of... <laughs> It's great. I, yeah, quite. Geek, geeky's got um, it's got a negative connotation, and I don't, I don't think I see it as the opposite, because I was always a geek, and I always think, you know, what does geek mean anyway? That yeah. you're in, that you're into culture, and that you're into, you know, bohemian things. Maybe I don't know that I you like know. to study. It's the ridiculous. thing I like to see as is, 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 is it's I, I, I'm, I see it as like a circle. It's like a cycle. And how you enter this circle, there are sort of two points. You, you either know the film and then you come into that and then you join that kind of, that churn of the circle and you go out learning about something you had no idea that the film was associated with or inspired or was inspired by. Mm -hmm. And it takes you off into another realm that could be, you know, fashion or conceptual art or propaganda or philosophy or whatever. You could yeah. get into something just through having a love of this little film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you could be interested in one of those other things I've just mentioned and then stumble across this film and watch it and be like wow so it's it's like a, a sort of an endless cycle that, that i really love and my job is to just put triggers on those circles so relate how this film this prop that looks like something you could own from that kind of universe is related to shepherd fairy is related to slavo zizek or how john grant loves the music in it or how you know a thousand street artists have been had their careers launched from this and you know brand hacking and all these kind of rich sort of things these countercultural things that have happened before that the film drew on and have then gone out and mm. have had an impact since and i think there's so many little layers in that and yeah. for me it was it was getting those people that i've just mentioned so we interviewed shepherd fairy and he he loves the film he absolutely adores the film and he was like, yes, we spoke to him and he wrote a piece for it and we showed how his work relates to it all. The, the fact that he, he took Obey from that and pulled it into his work as a command. Even down to like Slavo Zizek, who's talked about it in his films, but also thinks it's a really great like Hollywood left kind of film. And down to film critics who talk about where it comes from, from literature and the fact that it's based on a short story and all the other short stories that are around at the time that... Because it's really 50s, despite being an 80s film, it's actually really 1950s. It's really kind of paranoid, kind of US Android. yeah, culture. Yeah, and it's about drawing all those things. And that I then sort of sewed these kind of individual pieces from these cultural luminaries together with the bigger ideas that I think are in the film, such as uh, hyper-masculinity in the way that I think that the character in there, the female character played by Meg Foster... How I feel she challenges all the male stereotypes that were mm. around in the 80s. I talk about, obviously, mass media and how that's sort of affected, because this is pre-internet and it, telly was the bad guy, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and, all, and the visual culture of these aliens and how conceptual art, predominantly all women. So, you know, Barbara Kruger, you know, the Gorilla Girls, all of their work feeds into 
what those commands look like on screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of that, and I fucking forgot what the other one is, <laughs> but, you know, oh, the politics, yeah, the politics. So how yeah, yeah, yeah. it is a reflection on how a mass neoliberal individualist society treats its most vulnerable yeah. and how the fact that the guy who saves the day isn't this guy from the army or from privilege or from anything like that. He's, he's a working poor man who wanders into this city because he can't go anywhere else to get a job. Yeah. So it's all of that in this big melee for me. <laughs> now that is a book you could have shown your nan. Yeah. And I could have told it. Yes, yes, I did write it, Nan. Yes, I did get those pictures. Yes, I did fucking draw that. And yes, I did set that lovely typeface. You talk about horror movies a lot. I think, is that, am I getting a hint that that's one of your favourite genres? And... I like horror and sci-fi, yeah. And yeah. The re But the reason I like horror, it, well, there's lots of reasons why I like horror, yeah. but I find, it, I find it one of the more creative mediums for film. It's always looked down on, you know, it's... By, you know, you're kind of the, uh, what would you call it, the authority, I guess, the Oscars and all that. Then you never, very, very rarely do you see horror winning anything mm. um, or even getting a nomination. I mean, that's Did been aliens booking. get anything? No, I don't think, you probably got some in the technical and all the craft categories. Yeah, you should have got something. The Exorcist something. was nominated for Best Picture, right. I think, and a couple of others like Best Director, but I don't think it won any of them. Right. Uh, I th what was it? Um, I mean, she get was... Get Out. Was one more recently that was yeah. in the in the mix, but they're very few and far between. And I think what the sort of the good side to that is that it's always been a peripheral mm. kind of genre, so it's much more creative, and there's much more stuff that goes on. More. Yeah, where they get where they're always pushing boundaries, exactly, and they're always challenging and they're always reinventing things. It's also like a really accessible genre because there's more new directors having their first film as horror than they would do doing a drama, for example. Yeah. And some of the ones that we now probably know as household all made, like Spielberg made a horror film first. You know, it was Duel, about the, which is ripped off by Jeepers Creepers with that van scene chasing him. Oh. That's all based on Duel and Jaws, of course. So I love that. It's like it's like a starter for filmmakers. And, and I also love how it completely changes so many kind of dynamics. I love how amazing women are and how, how nine times out of ten women are the strongest characters in those films and yeah, I think they that are, again actually. really books a I lot of trends that you see way, everywhere actually. else I um, never you know being a woman myself I mean growing up with movies and, and seeing you know given what the world was like and how it's changed during my lifetime you're right I mean Weaver in Aliens mm. I mean what a character there's so many I mean, it's... and I as a, as, a, as a young girl I was like looking at her thinking I wasn't thinking she was a woman well maybe I was I mean I was very young um, but that again that's an issue isn't it it's, it's sort of I just thought I, I, don't, she was I don't great. think I was aware of it as a kid. I no, just, you weren't. I was just, I was just rooting for her. You know, yeah, me just too. like, yeah, go on. She was great. And it didn't matter if, if it was a man or a woman. It was just that's 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 my hero that I'm identifying with. Mm. And for me, it, I, I, I didn't ever think twice about it being a woman at all. But I, I used to, you know, I love Sigourney Weaver and I yeah, love her yeah, in yeah. that film. And there's, you know, there's loads of them that that, that could, like Jamie Lee Curtis. I love in Halloween, and she's like an absolute idol because she's just like. Seen perceived as this sort of goofy, nerdy, you know, mm. goody two shoes at school, and she fucking kicks his ass. You know, well, and they've it's, just it's got many layers, haven't they? It, yeah. they're, they're not characters that are one-dimensional. That might often be the case in other genres. Yeah, um, they're they're not just a pretty face. <laughs> exactly, and I don't I don't know if it's like not to get too deep on it, but I don't know if it's like me seeing people like my mum in those characters because you know I used to remember my mum, she'd work these horrific long shifts at work and then she'd come home and like wallpaper the house you know at, at midnight you know and that's, cause that's the only time she could do this stuff uh -uh. and I used to really like appreciate like her work ethic and her strength and her kind of stoicism and all this kind of shit she had to deal with and yeah, she was still she never took it out on me you know she never shouted at me or she was always encouraging she always had time for me and I see that maybe up on screen in people like Sigourney Weaver kicking, you know, just being sensible. Lock the fucker in quarantine. <laughs> Why let the alien out? You know, and, yeah. and the men are too busy like, oh, we'll get a Nobel Prize for this. You know, <laughs> so, something like that. Yeah. And, but also her strength and also mm. her intelligence and her wit and her sensitivity and her femininity, those things coming through and me just loving it. And just thinking, you know, fucking brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that is so, so much more, rightly or wrongly, a thing in horror and in science fiction. Mm. 
I don't know why, but I, I, that's just another thing that I, I find it. I just think it's quite interesting. I think it's better to see different people doing different things. Why why has it always got to be the white man saving the day? Yeah, or, oh God. Or the rich man, Amen. or the, the army man, or, you know, whatever the fuck man. It's just, I'm tired of that. You see it all the time, so let's see something different. Well, thank you so much for your time. I never knew that we'd end up talking about Sorry, movies yeah. so much. It's great. Away there. <laughs> I clearly, clearly got you on a subject you adore, which is great because, you know, obviously I, I enjoy it too. And uh, if you want to go and have a play on, <laughs> sounds a bit dodgy, Craig's soundboard, <laughs> yes. it's um, on his website and I'll provide links after this episode. So thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. You've been listening to the Creative Boom podcast with your host, Katie Cowan. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review. Go to creativeboom.com forward slash podcast to find out more and say hello on Twitter at Creative Boom or you can follow me at Katie L. Cowan.